Now, on Saturday night, I, um, I talked a bit about scientific consensus. And so over the last week, I've got a bit of feedback about my talk. Some positive, some negative. On the positive side, at the start of my talk, I, um, I promised that there wasn't going to be anything sexy in my talk. And, and one person uh, disagreed with that. She said that science is sexy. So I thought that was good. Now, on the negative side, some people had a few concerns. And when they, when they um, argued their point, the, the funny thing was I actually agreed with them, what they were saying. And so what I think happened was some people misunderstood what I was trying to communicate about consensus. So what I'm going to do today is talk about my PhD research into the psychology of consensus. And along the way, I'm going to try to reduce some misconceptions about consensus. And I'll do that in the only way that I know how, with an iPhone app. So, yeah, so I'm going to um, just try to debunk a few myths about communicating consensus while I'm talking about uh, my PhD research. Now, I'm just going to do a little bit of background, and I apologise that most of you are probably extremely familiar with this. Now, over the last few years, there's been a number of studies that measuring the level of agreement in the climate science community about human-caused global warming. Two studies, or two surveys of climate scientists found that around 97% of climate scientists who are actively publishing agree about human-caused global warming. In the scientific literature, in the published research, there's also an overwhelming consensus. And this, this was first found by Naomi Erezquez in 2004. But uh, in the last few weeks, um, I um, published a paper where we looked at 21 years of climate research, identified all the papers that stated the position on human-caused global warming. And among those roughly 4,000 papers, again, around 97% of them endorsed the consensus. Now, we also asked the scientists who wrote the papers to also uh, rate the, who wrote the papers to, to rate the level of endorsement of their own research. And we got about 1,200 scientists rating their own papers. And when you looked at the, the papers that were self-rated as stating a position on human-caused global warming, in that case, we also found around 97% of those papers endorsed the consensus. This isn't working. Now, while the consensus has been getting stronger over the last two decades, there's also been a, a persistent attack on consensus, casting doubt. And there's a, I've just given a few examples, and I'll just uh, highlight one of them. In 2000, Frank Luntz argued, or, or advised uh, Republicans in the 2000 election, that should the public come to believe that the scientific issues are settled, their views about global warming will change accordingly. Now, the result of this persistent campaign to cast out on the consensus is that now, this is a survey that I conducted with a US representative sample earlier this year, uh, now we have a, a significant gap between the public perception of consensus and the actual reality. Now, the reason why this is significant is because in 2011, a study by Ding et al. Found, that, found a link between perceived consensus and support for climate policy. So in other words, when people, when people thought that the scientists disagreed about global warming, then they were less likely to support climate action. Now, this result was replicated in this year, earlier, uh, in a paper by Aaron McCryant. And I'll just, just read the last bit of his concluding paragraph where he, where he had he suggested that closing the consensus gap is crucial for increasing public support for emissions reduction policies. Uh, I think it's interesting to note too that over the last few years, social scientists have been joining the dots between perception of consensus and policy support. But Frank Luntz was there over a decade ago and he was, he was designing strategies uh, with this insight uh, long before these papers were published. So, so we see that, um, that cons um, consensus information has an effect on policy support, but it also has an effect on uh, people's uh, belief about human-caused climate change. 
Now, earlier this year, Stefan Lewandowski published a paper in Nature Climate Change where he ran an experiment where he presented consensus information to people. Now, it, this graph shows the, the level of belief in human-caused global warming. And then across the x-axis, we have political ideology or, or free market support. And toward, as you go towards the right of the graph, it, you're getting more conservative. So we see the red line, which is the control group in his experiment. They didn't receive any consensus information. And we see that there's a, a strong link between climate belief and political ideology. Now, what's interesting about this, this experiment was after he presented consensus information, the slope disappeared. Uh, uh, consensus information reduced the influence of ideology on people's climate beliefs. So with my, my research, I'm interested in exploring the psychology of what's going on here. Now, I started off by running an experiment where I compared the effects of presenting consensus information to, com to presenting evidence. And for my evidence, I used um, uh, an inf infographic from Skeptical Science about human fingerprints. Now, was it, was it Joe that was talking about fingerprints earlier today? Well, I forget who it was, but someone was saying that um, fingerprints are actually a great metaphor for uh, explaining how humans are affecting climate. Now, what I found was um, con consensus actually outperformed evidence in, in changing people's beliefs that humans are causing global warming. Now, but let me be perfectly clear, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be presenting evidence. Uh, it's, it's very important that, that our science is evidence-based and that we are communicating evidence to the public. Um, and so that brings me to my first um, uh, myth about consensus that I'd like to um, debunk. Because a few people came up to me um, during the week and said, well, you know, w consensus is good, but we really should be talking about this. And, and really that's a false dichotomy. Um, w there are lots of messages we should be giving depending on the audience, the context, on what events we're responding to and on what outcome we want to get from our communication. And, and I, having a debate between whether we should be talking about consensus or whether we should be talking about extreme weather is a false dichotomy. We should be talking about both. And, and on the flip side of that, another thing that people have been saying is that because presenting consensus information isn't going to fully fix a problem, we shouldn't be mentioning it at all. And really that's the case of letting perfect be the enemy of good. Consensus obviously, obviously isn't a magic bullet to fix everything, but what it does do is it removes one roadblock towards getting support for climate policy or for climate action. Now, with my next experiment, um, I wanted to explore uh, perceptions of expertise. Uh, we've already looked earlier today about, and throughout the week, a few people have mentioned data that says that climate scientists are actually the most trusted uh, group or sources of climate information. So I designed an experiment that made expertise uh, more prominent, and just to see how that would what kind of effects that would have compared to consensus information. So I had to, the way I decided to do it was think of a climate scientist who exude expertise. And so running through my brain thinking of all the different climate scientists that I could use, one, one actually did jump out at me. And it's, it's a scientist who's actually, well, he's, he's kind of so distinguished that I actually find him a little bit intimidating. Um, so I went with Richard Somerville, and so just apologies to all the very distinguished climate scientists in this room, many of whom are my heroes, but maybe Richard has a bit of X factor, I don't know. <laughs> so anyway, this is the intervention I used, which explained the science and also made expertise more prominent. And the effect of this experiment was actually no statistically significant impact on, on climate belief. I'm sure if you put Richard in a room with all the participants in this experiment, there'd be a statistically significant effect. And I still think Richard is awesome. But what the take home from this experiment was that, again, consensus information was statistically more significant in, in changing people's beliefs. Uh, the really interesting 
um, element to this data was how, how belief um, updating um, changed across political ideology. So this graph shows the, the change in belief and then across, across different pol political ideology on the x-axis. And the size of the circle indicates the, si the number of participants. So I, I just broke it up into separate groups. So obviously, in the middle of the um, ideological spectrum, that's where you get most people. And what we found was overall there was a positive effect. But most interestingly, the effect got larger as you got more conservative. And this confirmed the results from, from Stephen Lewandowski's Nature Climate Change paper. But then I also repeated this experiment with an American representative sample. And this is a result I got. So, so there's a couple of interesting features in this data. Um, firstly, in the bottom right corner, there's this little circle which didn't appear in the Australian sample, but um, a small group of extreme free market supporters that, that somehow, well, it doesn't seem to be in the Australian sample. The other feature, the, one of the most interesting elements of this data is the fact that the interaction between free market and change in belief is, is, goes in the opposite direction to the Australian sample. And I had a lot of fun just jumping backwards and forwards between these. But the one thing that both these data sets have in common is that for the vast majority of the participants, regardless of where they are on the spectrum, there was a, a positive change in belief. And, and that's why for both samples, there was a significant increase in climate belief in response to consensus information. So that brings me to the next myth, which, uh, five minutes, all right. Uh, the next myth, which is the argument that if it, consensus information might be a polarizing message, so therefore we shouldn't use it. And, and my response to that is that, that overall, over the whole population, consensus has a positive effect. And it only has a negative effect among a small proportion of the population. So I think y you have to question I mean, a few people have brought up throughout this week, should we be, um, I guess, tying ourselves into knots over how a, of the a small minority who have very entrenched views will react to our messages? Or should we be targeting our messages to, to the broader, uh, to the vast majority of people who aren't so firmly entrenched in their views? Uh, okay, now, another element to the data and this was in both samples, although it was a little bit uh, steeper in the American sample, was that the perceived consensus um, had a strong link with political ideology. And conservatives were actually, um, the, their perceived consensus was less than half of people at the, um, at the low free market support end of the scale. But even then, even for the people at the end, at the, with low free market support, there was still a significant gap between what, how they perceived the consensus and, and the actual 97%. So, so this brings me to the next myth, which the, during the week there's been a lot of talk about the deficit model, and it's been getting beaten up a fair bit, I think, which I think is a little bit unfair. Because what this, what this data shows is cultural values does have a big influence on on people's attitudes and beliefs, but even for people whose cultural values are consistent with accepting the science, there's still significant misconceptions. So I think the debate between the deficit model and, and cultural models is another false dichotomy. We need to be employing both. And Dan Cahan actually suggests this approach when he says that communicators, climate communicators, should um, use two, two channels of science communication, an information channel and a channel that takes into account cultural values. And I'll, I'll just um, repeat the, uh, Aaron McCrite's concluding paragraph in his paper. And I'll just go right to the end where he says that with presenting consensus, one challenge is presenting it in such a way that we don't cause backfire effects among conservatives. And how am I going? Two minutes. 
which uh, I like that under the sort of uh, understatement of peer review, a major challenge. I, I, it, that's a very uh, mild way of expressing it. But but I would I would question should should we be trying to package consensus information in a in a culturally um, uh, acceptable view? I, I, that's an open question. I'd be interested in hearing people's thoughts about it. But to me, the main question isn't should we be communicating consensus, but how? What, what are the ways to do it and how can we explore uh, options? And, and because there are so many, um, many indicators of consensus, it means that, that it, it, there are lots of ways that people do this. And I, everyone I've talked to during the week has, has another, a different way of looking at it. I'll go very quickly. There's the analysis of papers, there's the surveys, the IPCC, which will become important later this year, and the National Academies of Science get brought up quite a lot. But Hunter Cutting had a really good point this morning that we need to show, not tell. It's a much more powerful way of communicating. And the way that scientists frame the science is often putting the emphasis on what we don't know. And what they really need to be doing is putting the emphasis on what we do know when they talk to the public. Thank you.